Okay, good afternoon and thank you for coming along today. Fittingly, it is exactly 15 years to the day since Museum of London Archaeology Service, now MOLA, started the archaeological evaluation at Harry Crescent in Prisoner, South End on Sea. The excavation concluded 63 days later on Christmas Eve 2003. What we expected would be a straightforward exercise, in fact uncovered quite unexpectedly, an intact Anglo-Saxon princely burial, the first to be discovered since the Sutton Hoo ship burial in 1939. This was a find of national and international importance. Today's lecture is in two parts. I will briefly describe the discovery and exploration of the chamber and its contents, and Chris will then outline some of the results that have come from the complex analytical work undertaken since 2010 and summarise what we think we can say about the identity and circumstances of the individual buried here. The evaluation was undertaken on land bordered by Priory Crescent to the west and the London South End Railway Line to the east. The work was commissioned by South End on Sea Borough Council in advance of a proposed road widening scheme in the area of a known Anglo-Saxon cemetery. Chance and good fortune will always have a part to play in archaeological discovery, and this is vividly illustrated by the decision to move the first evaluation trench at the south end of the site eastwards from its original location to allow sufficient space for machine excavated spoil to be stockpiled around three sides of the trench. In doing so, the trench was fortuitously placed directly over the intact and richly furnished early Anglo-Saxon chamber grave. Had a larger machine with a greater reach been used, the trench would not have been moved and the chamber would have remained undiscovered. An unusually large four metre square pit emerged in a central position on the east side of the trench on the first day of the excavation. Significant, significantly, the inner compacted sand and gravel fill at the vertical side of the pit appeared to overlie a more organic fill that extended around and mirrored the edges of the feature. The interpretation of this outer fill as the possible remains of a timber lining was confirmed on the second day of the excavation with the discovery of a copper alloy hanging bowl lying on its side in an elevated position in the northwest corner of the pit. One of the suspension rings of the bowl was hooked over a corroded piece of iron and it became clear that the bowl, which had been hung on a wooden chamber wall, was still in situ. Because of concerns over security, it was decided to block lift the hanging bowl on the day it was found and move it off site for safekeeping. With the discovery and the significance of the chamber grave now realised, full nighttime security was introduced to protect the site. This photo shows the ongoing excavation of the burial chamber, with some of the grave goods beginning to emerge around its edges. Also visible are the trace remains of the substantial north-south roof timbers that once spanned the burial chamber and supported the earth mound above it, now reduced to barely discernible linear organic stains across the east half of the chamber. These ephemeral traces represent the partial remains of three adjoining roof timbers that had slowly decayed and settled unevenly into the chamber. The construction pit for the burial chamber measured 4.35 metres by 4 metres and was 1.4 metres to 1.5 metres deep from the prepared Anglo-Saxon ground surface, with the original internal dimensions of the line chamber being 3.8 metres by 3.4 metres. It had originally been covered by a barrow mound, now ploughed flat. The chamber had contained a coffin burial and a rich assemblage of grave goods. Some of these had been hung on the walls and other placed around the coffin on the chamber floor. The gradual filtration of wash or wash of deposits through the slowly decaying chamber roof meant that the majority of the grave goods appeared to have been retained in 
or very close to their original positions. Most striking were the vessels still on their hooks on the decayed north and east walls of the chamber. Three of these can be seen in, the in this photograph. The shape of the coffin was preserved by deposits that filtered through the roof and built up around it, fixing the iron fittings in situ and preserving the shape of the coffin as a void. The coffin was 2.25 metres by 0.85 metres and at least 0.5 metres high. Wood traces preserved on the nails of the iron fittings tell us that it was made of ash boards at least 40 millimetres thick. The coffin alone would have weighed around 200 kilograms, which is 440 pounds or 31 stone, if unseasoned green wood were used and it was clearly a status item. No skeleton survived, but the layout of dress fittings within the coffin indicated a male burial with the head to the west. The only human remains are four tiny fragments of tooth enamel found in an environmental sample from the west head end of the coffin. Found side by side at the head end of the coffin were two <coughs> tiny gold fold crosses. We believe that these have been placed over the eyes of the deceased. <coughs> The use of gold foil crosses at Priswell is unique in England. In the neck and or chest region of the burial was a delicate woven gold braid, also seen here in X-ray, which we believe was edging of a piece of cloth laid over the face. The largest and most striking object from the coffin area was the completely plain gold belt buckle, its relatively lightweight construction suggesting that it may have been purpose made for the burial and never actually been a functioning item. The smallest grave goods were the two tiny copper alloy garter buckles which are found at the east foot end of the coffin, further confirming the orientation of the body. Two gold coins, Frankish tremises, were also found within the coffin space and may have been placed in the hands of the corpse. Found in a tight cluster on the floor in the northeast corner of the chamber were 57 gaming pieces made of whalebone and two large dice made of deer antler. These had originally been hung in a bag on the wall along with a gaming board with iron fittings. In the same corner of the chamber stood an iron stand or candelabrum, 1.33 metres, 4 foot 4 inches tall, still standing upright on its four feet. Pressure from the roof timbers as they started to decay had, had, and settle had slightly bent the shaft of the stand and damaged the prongs at the top. These have been reattached and are shown in the right hand image. <coughs> At the east, foot end of the coffin was a large copper alloy cauldron, originally hung from the wall on a peg. Between the cauldron and the foot end of the coffin were the remains of an iron lamp with an open bowl, similar to those from other princely burials at Sutton Hoo and at Broomfield in Essex. This had probably fallen from the lid of the coffin and is perhaps the most evocative object of all. It may have been a light and the chamber was finally sealed. On the floor along the east wall of the chamber was an array of drinking vessels including two pairs of glass beakers, two drinking horns with highly de decorative gilded copper alloy rim mounts and five turned wood drinking cups with gilded mounts. Two wooden buckets with iron fittings had been placed in the southeast corner of the chamber. So that's there. And a much larger wooden tub in the northwest corner. So up at the top, in the top left. <laughs> Within the tub were a scythe blade and a small copper alloy bowl. The bowl was placed in the tub at the time of the burial, but the scythe, with its willow or poplar handle, was originally racked on the chamber wall. 
When the handle decayed, the scythe blade fell into the tub below. A liar in a bag had been placed upside down on the floor at the south, south of the chamber. The wooden structure of the instruments had almost completely decayed, leaving only a soil stain with the metal fittings preserved in their original positions. On top of the liar was a corroded lump of iron, which proved to be two spearheads, an arrowhead and a wall hook. The weapons had originally been racked on the south wall and fallen as the wall timbers decayed. All the weapons in the burial assemblage, sword, shield, spears and arrow, were found in the southern half of the chamber, but only the sword appears to have been in situ. The shield was face down and would probably dropped from the hook on the chamber wall. The sword was laid on the chamber floor at right angles to the coffin. In the southwest corner of the chamber had been placed a wooden chest and a painted wooden box. The remains of the box and its contents were block lifted for excavation in the conservation laboratory. The contents of the box included a silver spoon with an inscription on the bowl, a small cylindrical copper alloy container, an antler comb, a knife and a fire steel. By the west, head end of the coffin was an iron folding stool, which originally had a leather seat. Like the gold foil crosses, this is a unique find in Anglo-Saxon England. We were able to record a great deal during excavation, but because metal objects preserve fugitive traces of organic materials such as leather and textiles, our conservators block lifted most of the items for micro-excavation in the laboratory. This and subsequent scientific examination has provided another level of detail allowing us to identify, for example, the textiles, probably cloaks, draped over the coffin, and details of carpentry and woodworking. From this, we can paint a fuller picture of the burial chamber and the grave assemblage at the point of burial. This is our reconstruction of the oak burial chamber. How long was it before the roof collapsed? Estimates by engineers with expertise in load-bearing structures and materials range from a minimum of 50 to upwards of 200 years. It is clear from the finds still in situ that the chamber wall still retains sufficient structural integrity to continue standing after the roof collapsed. Evidence for, this, for the longevity of the chamber is provided by the brittle fracture impact or compression damage noted on the sword shield boss and lamp. This damage was caused by the collapse of the roof and overlying mound into the chamber when the iron was almost wholly mineralised. We estimate that in the open chamber environment the time required to reach this level of mineralisation was in the order of hundreds of years. Um, I will now hand over to Chris for the second part of our presentation. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you very much. I want now to turn to what we think we can say about the identity and circumstance of the people who are buried here, um, and what this might tell us about lifestyle and belief in elite social circles in the decade either side of St. Augustine's arrival in Kent in AD 597. Now, the discovery made a very considerable impact and for a while, unusually for archaeology, it was national news. And it really is an important find. As Ian said, this is the first in the fact Anglo-Saxon princely burial found since the Southern Hoosier burial in 1939. And it is the only one to be excavated to the painstaking modern standards. And from the outset, there were some very strong preconceptions and ideas about what the burial might mean. The Sun newspaper, <laughs> and then a Times New documentary, <laughs> fixed this persona of the King of Lee in public consciousness. A lot of attention was also paid to the gold foil crosses as Christian symbols, and there was a strong idea that this was the grave of King Sabert of the East Saxons, 
recorded by Bede as the first Christian king in these texts. And beyond this, the idea that this was a king and that he belongs to Pribblewell, not to South End on the Sea, has been a long running issue in, in local politics as well. <laughs> Um, and National Geographic's widely reproduced reconstruction painting, the Fernando burial shown here, um, reinforced these expectations by showing the deceased as a mature man. Now, all of these initial assumptions and more became open to challenge as we began to examine the evidence in greater detail. And just to give a bit of background, this sort of extravagant princely burial, so-called, was, was a periodic phenomenon of Northwestern European society from later prehistory, from something like the sixth or seventh century AD, uh, BC. But in Anglo-Saxon England, it's a short-lived phenomenon of the later sixth and the earlier seventh centuries AD. And these burials are interpreted as being the graves of people who belong to the new ruling classes, the new ruling elites of the regional Anglo-Saxon kingdoms that we know to be established from the later 6th century. And the argument runs that this sort of level of investment and display in burial wealth and burial monumentality can only be undertaken by a paramount social or political class, and that it served to assert and to legitimize a new and perhaps slightly precarious social and political status. And this line of thinking allows us to locate the Prittlewell burial broadly within the context of the emerging Kingdom of East Saxons, or perhaps more properly, the construction of an elite political East Saxon identity. Now, when as archaeologists we're faced with interpreting a burial like this, our starting point has to be that what we're looking at, of course, is intentional. That decisions were taken and the material was selected to convey messages about the person who was buried here and the group, the people who were burying them. The symbolism of the burial is many faceted, it's complex and many faceted, and I believe, we believe, that it was intended to be so. There are many overlapping, interlocking, and reinforcing messages that onlookers would have taken from the funeral spectacle and which they would have remembered when they saw the barrow upstanding in the landscape. And we can attempt to read the burial by taking a comparative approach, assessing how it conforms to, differs from, or reinvents the wider patterns that we can see in Anglo-Saxon burial practice. And that's really the basis on which I'm talking today. And I want to start by making two or three, two or three fairly basic points. The first is the nature of the chamber itself and what it evokes. It can be seen superficially as that house or hall, and it's been interpreted in this way. It is, after all, a room with soft furnishings, furniture, and feasting equipment, and so forth. But I think on reflection, we can see that this is far too simple a reading. It doesn't show how any single space would have been in life, but it's a symbolic mashup. It's an illusion of the hall or the house. It's a conflation of different spheres of activity and social spaces into a single complex metaphor for this individual's role and this individual's status. Something else which we think is fairly clear in the burial is that tradition is manipulated in it. Christianity, symbolized by the gold crosses, was radically new at this time. An ostentatious burial on this scale emphasized a new paramount status. But the Christian symbols here are being deployed within the traditional furnished burial rite. And ostentatious princely burial is itself an amplification of this traditional clone and furnished inhumation. So what is new here is presented quite deliberately in traditional ways. And this is legitimized by aligning it with the familiar. And I think this could also be seen in the fact that the grave is located in an existing cemetery with its links to forebears and to a wider community. And there are also statements here and implications here about wealth and resource. It's a powerful statement, this assemblage, about the control of manpower and control of portable wealth. And so about this kindred's ability to reward followers, for example. 
Portable wealth, anyway, is not just treasure, although it is that. It also embodies a range of high level dynastic and social contacts. It extended, directly or indirectly, from Western Britain or Scotland at one end of the, the range to the Eastern Mediterranean at the other. And anyone seeing these items in the burial tablet at the steps and at the funeral would be reminded of this social range and the range of these high level social contacts. The material, therefore, has been selected to symbolise aspects of the individual's personal identity and social roles, and so by extension to make a statement about their importance and position by his kin or whoever it was who buried him. So we move on to considering what were these identities. And first of all, to look at the question of the age and the sex or gender of the individual buried here. As Ian has said, nothing of the skeleton survived except a tiny fragments of tooth enamel from secondary molars, um, which tell us that the person buried here was at least six or seven years old when they died, which honestly would probably have concluded anyway. We know almost certainly that this was a male. There is none of the dress jewellery that you would expect in female inhumation, and a male or masculine identity is conveyed through burial with weapons, a sword, shield, two spears, and an arrow. Now, the provision of weapons in burial was age-related, and a full weapon kit like this is normally something with corded adults. But interestingly, single arrows very rarely if ever occur in adult variants of full weapon kits and are more usually found with juvenile arrows. So the presence of a single arrow with a full weapon kit at Pretty might suggest that this was an older adolescent or a very young adult, perhaps 15 to 18 years old when they died. It is also very unusual that the sword is placed away from the body in the coffin, and I'll come back to that a bit later in the talk. <laughs> Elements of personal identity as an individual are also conveyed um, through the clothing that the corpse is wearing, and through elements of a box assembly, which the end has alluded to, things like the comb, the spoon, and the knife. These are very, very personal items. Now, when such box assemblages are found in male burials at this time, they again tend to be in those of young <coughs> men. And some of the closest formal parallels of the Brittle World Buckle are also in the graves of young males, often with just such box assemblages. So there may be further circumstantial evidence here that the Brittle World individual died young. And I've put up this picture of the buckle from Finkelstrom Grave 95, which if you <coughs> strip away the decoration on the outside, he is very much of the same size and the same form as that from Critical Well. And, and Fingles from 95 is the grave of a, of a young man. It's, it's an example of this, this small trend that I was, I was alluding to. We have to consider whether public personas are symbolised in the burial. Now, much of the material of the burial assemblage is linked to the social obligations, or appears to be linked to the social obligations of lordship, centred around providing for followers and household and hospitality. Of the hall. So we have the equipment that is associated with the preparation and serving of food and drink, such as the cauldrons and the buckets. And we've got equipment associated with the consumption of food and, frankly, mainly of drink, in particular the drinking horns, the wooden beakers, and glass beakers. I'm assuming that the buckets are not drinking vessels, but if you tried to drink out of the buckets, you would fall over. And if you drank out of the tub, you'd just die. <laughs> The other thing here is the lyre. Um, now, the lyre was an instrument of public poetry and of performance in the feasting hall. It had a role in panegyric and a role, and so a role in oral diplomacy at an elite level. So we see it less as a personal instrument um, and more as a symbol of lordly cultural patronage and public persona in a society where tradition and traditional knowledge were transmitted orally. Now, what's interesting is if this was an adolescent or a very young man, then it may be that much of the assemblage that's been buried with him, has, uh, <coughs> in, in this way, um, symbolizes potentiality, like birthright or what he stood to become, rather than what he had actually been. So we actually ask whether elements of the, of the assemblage were compensatory, like, for example, the buckle, which probably was not owned by the individual in life, but was almost certainly knocked up for burial after he had died. And it was felt necessary to provide him with something 
appropriate to his social class and to what he might have achieved in life. There are interesting questions around our cultural identity. We can say with some justification that this assemblage looks out of place in contemporary Essex, but it's true that every princely grave looks out of place in its region. And this is because they are extreme expressions of elite identity, and they signal affiliation with or membership of an inter-regional elite or courtly culture. And as I've said, members of elite social circles at this time had far-reaching social, diplomatic, and exchange contacts. One of the ways in which these were maintained is through gift giving, and prestige items which embodied these contacts were used to display status. Objects in the critical grave symbolised high level contacts with the British kingdoms to the north and west, the hanging bomb, with the Merovingian continent, the gold coinage, and beyond that to Italy and the Byzantine Mediterranean, the flagon, the basin, and the spoon. So this is somebody whose social circle, as we said, had a very long reach indeed. So when we look at the assemblage, we can argue that at one simple level, the deceased was well provided for in the afterlife. And although there's a tendency for academics to dismiss this sort of reading as simplistic, I happen to believe myself that equipping the dead appropriately for whatever is to come has been and sometimes remains a powerful and widespread human response to death. But it's not the whole story. The burial tableau is a complex and powerful statement, which gives us a good idea of what the people laying out the burial thought were the important social roles, identities, obligations. And it gives us an insight into how these materially express in everyday life at the time. It also gives us a glimpse into elite consumption and to the lifestyle and the infrastructure of production and of skills that supported it, because the resource and skill that <coughs> lies behind at the base of the pyramid of which these things are the apex is very, very considerable. A big question, was this person a king, is this King Sigurd? Well, the symbolism that we see in Prittlewell is replicated in other princely graves, although the emphasis placed on different elements varies in case to case. We can perhaps get some sense of calibration within the elite stratum of early English society by comparing Prittlewell with Mount the Band One Ship Bearer of the Southern Who, which is usually identified as that of Redwald, King of the East Angles, who died in the 620s AD. Now, the assemblage of Southern Who is immensely more wealthy than that of Prittlewell. There's the enormous treasure of Byzantine silver, there are 37 rather than two gold coins. But it had evidence of social roles that we don't see in the Brittle Well area. There is in Southern Hill an element of ancestral identity, the importance of ancestral identity, epitomised by the heirloom shield and the whetstone, which has been argued is an ancestor pattern symbolic of that individual's lineage. The number of weapons, the helmet and the male shirt of Southern Hill, have been seen as symbolising a role here as a war leader and head of a war band above and beyond the individual masculine identity that weapon burial is normally held to convey. And at Southern Hill as well, there's an argued regalia element that symbolizes a kingly role, which perhaps has a priestly or sacral element to it. So it's been argued, as I've said, that the whetstone is an ancestor pattern, that the axe hammer is a sacrificial implement appropriate to a priest king, and that the helmet with its mask face is Galian and is intended to give the wearer a godlike aspect. There are very complex arguments as to whether it's as to why some people think it's actually meant to represent Odin and give the person who wore it in the hall the mask of Odin. So, <coughs> Southern Hill Mount One is the grave of a regional king, perhaps a regional king with some claims to broader overlordship beyond his kingdom or his province. Then we have to conclude that Prittlewell, although it is the grave of an individual from the same elite social sphere does not express the same degree of political or military evidence. So while it's undoubtedly an individual of privilege and high status, on the basis of the evidence that we have, the person buried here was probably not a king, nor, when compared to other intact princely burials, was his burial particularly rich in precious metal. So contrary to the headlines, alas, this isn't actually the living king or the king of blue. 
I want to turn to the question of Christianity as it is expressed in the Septuagint period, and initially the question of God and follow the crosses. The crosses were made specifically for the burial, we can be pretty sure of this, and they're pretty unequivocally Christian symbols. But they are unique in England, and they're very unusual in other ways too. Gold foil crosses are found in 6th and 7th century burials in the areas of the Lombardic and Alemannic peoples, that is northern Italy and south Germany. <coughs> but they're not found in Merovingian Gaul, they're not found in Christian Gaul just across the channel. And where they are found in these other regions, and examples are shown here at the bottom left of the slide, they're different, they're equal armed, they're embossed, decorated, and they're usually attached, sewn to burial clothing. The brittle bone examples are of a Latin form with their ends, quite different. They were not attached to cloth or clothing, we can be absolutely sure of this, but they appear to be placed directly over the eyes of the body, we believe, and then covered with a cloth. Now, the use of gold foil crosses at Critical Well may be informed by knowledge of practice elsewhere, but it's not a direct transferring or borrowing because we can't find any other absolutely precise parallel for this practice. And there are two possibilities. The first is that it derives inspiration from Romanic, that is, native Italian burial practice, where so called stem crosses, um, golden sword crosses, were sometimes placed in burials. I'll show those in the top right of the, of the slide. Now, if this explanation is correct, then intriguingly it might imply the involvement of somebody from that area, possibly an Italian cleric, in the laying out of the burial. And if this is a post Augustinian burial, that's really quite interesting. The alternative is that the crosses derive their inspiration from a knowledge of continental burial practice, but they've copied the Latin cross from contemporary images that were available to people at the time from, for example, Byzantine Frankish God College. And there is, for example, a Latin cross with flared terminals on this magnificently syncretistic, syncretistic gold ring from Essex, which I've illustrated here, which is contemporary with the Critical World Burial, which appears to show a beast-headed man holding a flared-ended cross, accompanied by two styled two raptor birds. And it's held that this is actually probably Odin, but it's Odin holding a Christian symbol. Um, quite an interesting one. So the Critical World crosses, which are usually informed and unique in their usage, appear to represent a one-off response to the need to symbolise Christian belief in burial during the very earliest years of English Christianity, a local response to new circumstances. Now, the gold foil crosses are unequivocally Christian symbols, but we have to be cautious, I think, about reading other aspects of the assemblage in this law. It is actually possible to impose a Christian meaning on almost any, any element of burial, but we probably wouldn't think to do so if we didn't have the gold crosses. The spoon was cited in some early reports as linked to baptism, but we don't think that it was. These things are now usually seen as items of personal equipment as eating implements, and the inscriptions on the spoon are ownership marks, and nothing, nothing more than that. They say this, this spoon belongs to, and there are about three owners. It was a pre owned spoon before it was um, that acquired by the guy who got over here. This flagon or flask is a piece of East Mediterranean pilgrim kit. It was manufactured for pilgrims to the shrines of St. Sergius and the Bacchus of Sartre in Syria, but it may have been acquired in the same way as the other East Mediterranean vessels in England and have no religious significance in this particular burial context. It's been suggested that the coins were included because they have crosses on the reverse, but coins are not exclusive to Christian burial, and it's actually difficult to find any Frankish gold coin at this time that doesn't have a cross on the reverse. So any of these items might be encountered and explicable in a non-Christian burial of the period. Having said that, though, there are some aspects of the burial that do need some degree of explanation. There is, relatively speaking, the simplicity of the burial costume and the coffin assemblage, and the spatial distinction between the coffined body and the symbolically laid and artifact assemblages around it. 
And it could be argued that a distinction is being drawn here between the deceased, the departed soul, and the material symbols of the deceased's earthly roles. And in this context, it is very, very unusual, almost unique, for the sword to be placed away from the body of the coffin, and things like the knife that would normally be worn on the body to be placed away from the body. We have this very plain buckle, which contrasts with those from, for example, the Tapler of Sun Hu and other rich burials, and contrasts as well with the elaborate animal ornamentation of the Dream Horse vessels. Is there a deliberate distinction being drawn here? The cylindrical copper alloy container that he had mentioned, um, found in the remains of the painted box, these things are usually interpreted as amulet capsules or relic containers, and some later 7th century examples were certainly relic containers and had unequivocally Christian imagery on them. But if any of these aspects of the burial do reflect a Christian or Christianizing element, then like the crosses, they're best seen as a one off response to new considerations of the inception of Christianity amongst the English. And I should emphasize as well that there is nothing unchristian about burial with gravefields, and nothing about the animal ornament that we see on the fittings of the drooping horns and beakers that is incompatible with the profession of Christianity in an elite secular context at this time. Moving on to the date of the burial, which becomes quite critical in the interpretation. The termini post close, that's the date after which it was deposited, provided by the material culture items in the assemblage, which point to burial in the late 6th or early 7th centuries. The coins and Merovingian minted money are issued, a series broadly datable to the period 580 to 670, and on the grounds of gold finders, it's suggested that these ones, our two coins, are earlier rather than later. They were therefore deposited after 580, but unlikely to have been, been deposited much after 630. There is a publication, a recent publication, called Anglo-Saxon Graves and Grave Goods, a chronological framework, which establishes a phase sequence for Anglo-Saxon naval burials of this time. And this has quite precise date ranges, um, which are taken from radiocarbon dated burials um, within the phases that have been identified. And within this scheme, Prittlewell can be dated um, <clears throat> to within a period of 565 to 595 at the lower end and 580 to 610 at the upper end. That's a probabilistic um, definition. And this suggests it's slightly earlier than the princely burials of Taplow, Sutton Hoo, and Broomfield. And that was really the best we had before we began this project specific research. Now, no human bone survives the Brittle World burial to allow high precision radiocarbon dating of the body. But AMS dating, as accelerated mass spectrometry radiocarbon dating, of some of the organic items associated with the body, particularly the horn from drinking horns and wood from maple cup, did give us some additional data to allow us to say that the burial must be later than those dates. And on that basis, we've been able to remodel the date of the burial using Bayesian statistics, probabilistic statistics, taking these AMS dates, the coin dating, the radiocarbon model, and the burial phases as prior information. And as a result of this complex model, we've got an indication that the burial most probably dates to the 580s or the 590s AD. It is not the great one to say that, it's too early, and it is probable, though not certain, that it predates the Augustinian mission to England. Now, as a Christian burial, conventional understanding of conversion in the early history of the Saxon kingdom would suggest that Prittlewell should be later than 597, the date of the rest of the admission, and more probably in the lifetime of King Seder after his conversion, i.e. sometime between 64 and 616. Seder, as I said, was the first, <coughs> was the first Christian king of the East Saxons, converted around 864 at the head of his uncle, King Ethelbert of Kent, to whom, of course, the mission of St. Augustine was directed. He records that after the death of Seder, there was a strong anti-Christian reaction amongst the East Saxons, and that Melitus, the Bishop of the East Saxons, had to flee the territory, and that their Christianity was not re-established until the accession of Sigurdard in AD 653. We should also note that the relationship of baptismal sponsor to convert at a high political level mirrored political relationships. Seder was Eithelbert's nephew, and his conversion was linked to the acknowledgement of political alignment with Kent and probably some degree of Kentish overlordship. Now, none of this is conclusive, but it would provide a persuasive religious and political context for an elite Christian burial like Brittlewell. 
And this was the consensus before the refined archaeological dating opened up some new possibilities. A date for the burial before the Augustinian mission might appear problematic if it's a Christian burial before Christianity. But it's only problematic if we accept a face value of both Beat's narrative, which emphasizes the primacy of the Roman Augustinian mission while playing down other Christian contents, and if we accept some perhaps over literal recent interpretations of it. And I'm indebted to Professor Barbara York, a colleague on the project, for what I'm going to have to say. In fact, the societies of Southeast England in the later 6th century had long-standing contacts with Christian societies, which were strongest at the elite social level. King Ethelbert of Kent married a Christian Frankish princess, Bertha, and she brought with her to Kent her own bishop, Leopold. Ethelbert's <coughs> sister, the Ricula, the mother of Sigurd, may very well have been baptised at this time for Augustine. So there was a, both a long-standing knowledge of Christianity and at least a decade of a formal episcopal presence in Kent before the mission of Augustine. There's also evidence that during the initial contact and conversion, Christianity was something that Anglo-Saxon elite converts <laughs> might have to their portfolio of beliefs, but might pull back from if they were asked to commit to Christianity as an exclusive religion and public right. And um, this, and politics within the royal kindred, might explain the events following Seabert's death in Essex, rather than the reversion of Essex to militant paganism. That's usually inferred from Beat's account. So given the familial and dynastic links between Kent and East Saxons at the end of the 6th century and beginning of the 7th, we can begin to see how and why Christianity might be represented in an elite burial, without it necessarily having to be the grave of the main Christian king, or belonging to the Roman Christian king, or indeed necessarily post-dating the Augustinian mission. Now, in Essex, as in East Anglia, more than one princely burial site is known. And as Ian has alluded to, the other site in Essex is Broomfield, near Chelmsford. The burial assemblage was poorly excavated at the end of the 19th century, and it's incomplete. But it has a number of common features of the brittle well, notably these rare latticed blue glass beakers. And these are rare, and the largest number of them come from royal uh, sorry, elite graves in Essex. Both of these burials may be members of the East Saxon royal kindred, but there would have been other lordly or princely kindreds with territorial authority under the overlordship of kings. And both Prittlewell and Broomfield might be the burial grounds of such families. Now, taken together, Prittlewell and Broomfield refocus attention on the early kingdom of the East Saxons as a significant and wealthy polity that's perhaps been unfairly overlooked by historians because as a supposed apostate kingdom, it barely figures in Bede's account of the years between 620 and 650. But what we see in the archaeology we've looked at is that the East Saxon elite at the end of the 6th and the beginning of the 7th century commanded wealth, resources, and skills that were comparable with those of neighbouring Kent and the East Angles, the supposed big beasts of the period. And on the evidence of Prittlewell, they were also at the cutting edge of religious and cultural change. So what in the end can we say about the Prittlewell Prince? And that is a term, incidentally, that I think is fully justified by our emerging archaeological understanding. As is always the case with archaeology, interpretation depends on judging the balance of probabilities. And there were always alternate explanations. However, in our view, this was a man, possibly a very young man, of aristocratic or princely lineage, possibly a kindred of Sabin a Christian convert, or buried as one, who died at the end of the 6th century, or early in the 7th. He and his family, almost certainly in the state, centred on what is now Prittlewell, were regional power players, and enjoyed far-reaching social and political contacts. He lived at the apex of society, with a lifestyle supported by an agricultural population, skilled craftspeople and retainers, and access to imported luxuries and prestige items. And the reciprocal obligations of hospitality and largesse were so important to those who buried him, they're heavily represented in the symbolism of his grave. We don't know his name, we never will know his name, but we know enough to make sense of him in his time and place, and I don't think we should try to force the evidence by seeking to identify him with one of the handful of individuals named in written sources for this time. And perhaps most intriguingly, and perhaps most significantly, 
you had the possibility that he was linked to Christianizing or Christian circles amongst the Kentish elite, the Kentish court, before the mission of Augustine. The publication, full monograph publication of, of the burial, is completed and is in press and is due to be published March next year, March 2019. There will also be a lavishly illustrated, more accessible publication, which tells the salient points of the story without the huge weight of supporting technical evidence that has to be in the monograph. So, five months' time, everybody will be able to read all the evidence and conclude that what I've spoken today is he did go to kidneys. <laughs> now, analysis and publication. Excavation is a team effort. Analysis and publication is even more of a team effort. Um, and I absolutely have to end by acknowledging and thanking everyone who has worked on the project since 2012. That's more than 50 colleagues and specialists from universities, museums, the consulting sector, as well as from Museum of London Archaeology. And I have to thank as well the project sponsors who put the money in, South End Borough Council and Historic England. So thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.